Hello friends, welcome to Get Into IAS and this topic on environment and ecology is presented by me, Shipnas. So in the last chapter, we dealt with chapter 1 which deals with the topic ecosystem and in this chapter, we are going to deal with chapter 2 and these are the subtopics under chapter 2. So the topic we are going to deal today is functions of an ecosystem that is chapter 2 and under that we are going to see energy flow in this video and then we are going to deal with nutrient cycle and ecological succession or development. So under functions of an ecosystem it is very broad that is already we saw that ecosystem is the balance between living organism and then the physical environment. So this is the definition for ecosystem. So these two things share materials in between them and interact in between them. So this function of an ecosystem is broadly categorized into three subheadings called the energy flow, nutrient cycle and ecological succession or development. So what is an energy flow? So basically the energy flow starts with the green plants that is the producers. So the producers basically will be green plants that is which is capable of producing its own food and then this producer gives food to various organisms like herbivores, carnivores and then omnivores and then so this green plant is consumed by various organisms and then reaches the top carnivore that is for example a lion. So from green plants to lion the energy flow is continuous. And then there are different trophic levels in this energy flow. So what are these trophic levels? So this trophic level starts with autotrophs. So autotrophs are basically green plants and then comes the heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are primary consumers that is something which feeds on the green plants. For example the herbivore like goat. And then next also is heterotrophs that is the secondary consumer which feeds on the primary consumer. For example, it would be a carnivore, example wolf. And then the next subheading will also be heterotrophs and that is the tertiary consumer. For example, that is all that will also be a carnivore and then the last will be heterotroph and that is a quaternary consumer means that is the top carnivore for example the lion. So basically when we look into this trophic level there will be a loss of heat that is when one organism consumes another organism there will be loss of heat and this loss of heat will be called as the energy level that is the energy level will decrease from top to down that is from autotrophs to the top carnivore the energy level keeps decreasing and you have to note this point very importantly because the energy level will decrease from top to down in the trophic level and this energy level won't be reversed that is the energy level won't flow from bottom that is from the top carnivore to the autotrophs. So always the energy level will flow like this from top to bottom and then when you basically look into a trophic level there will be 4 to 5 trophic levels only like this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 basically in this trophic level from autotroph to the top carnivore there are 5 trophic levels. Why? Because after this there won't be much energy to support the further organism. In case there is a sixth trophic level and there is another top carnivore over here, this top carnivore won't get sufficient energy for life and hence the trophic level will be usually stopped at 5 that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in top carnivore. The trophic level starts with herbivore and ends with top carnivore. So there is a trophic level interaction between the herbivore to top carnivore. So what is a trophic level interaction? So the trophic level interaction is subdivided into three main headings. So the first heading is food chain, food web and then ecological pyramids. So the trophic level interaction is divided into three subheadings, food chain, 
food web and ecological pyramid so let's deal with what is a food chain so what is a food chain so organisms in ecosystem are related to each other through feeding mechanism so nothing but if you see this example you can very well understand the description of food chain so there is a plant here a rabbit feeds on this plant the rabbit is being eaten by the snake and then the snake is eaten by the hawk and then all these are decomposed by a decomposer so this is a food chain so nothing but organisms all these are organisms plant rabbit snake and then the hawk all these are organisms in an ecosystem this is an ecosystem in an ecosystem are related to each other through feeding mechanism so the plant is being eaten by rabbit so that is a feeding mechanism so that is called as a food chain so otherwise the sequence of eaten and being eaten produces transfer of food energy so there is a transfer of food energy over here so this is called as a food chain so food chain is nothing but the sequence of eating and being eaten produces transfer of food energy so that is basically called as food chain and then for example in a plant the plant converts the sun's energy that is the plant takes the sun's energy and convert into protoplasm so protoplasm is nothing but the living organ of a cell so this protoplasm is being produced by the process called as photosynthesis so in a food chain the sequence of eating and being eaten produces transfer of food energy and this transfer of food energy or the feeding mechanism between these organism is called as food chain so under trophic level interaction we were dealing with food chain there are types of food chain so what are these types of food chain the first thing is grazing food chain and the second thing is detritus food chain what is grazing food chain from the term grazing you may understand that animals are feeding on plants for their food so grazing food chain actually starts with plants that is the source will be plants and in grazing there are two types that is so there will be terrestrial grazing and aquatic grazing terrestrial grazing happens on land and aquatic grazing happens on water so what is grazing terrestrial and aquatic in terrestrial the source is plants that is it starts with plants the producers so plant is eaten by caterpillar and caterpillar is eaten by lizard and then lizard is eaten by snake this is grazing food chain in terrestrial part what is the grazing food chain in aquatic part that is it starts with the source that is the producers are planktons in aquatic source that is the planktons is eaten by zooplanktons and then the zooplanktons are eaten by fish and then the fish is eaten by pelican so this is the grazing food chain in aquatic region and then let's go to the detritus food chain so what is a detritus food chain so detritus food chain always starts with the dead organic matter it may be either plants or animals that is it will be a dead plant or animal that dead plant or animal will be eaten by the further upcoming organism so there is a better example over here for detritus food chain so it starts with a litter litter is actually the waste matter that is the dead and decaying matter so this litter is eaten by the earthworm and the earthworms are further eaten by chicken and the chicken is eaten by the hawk so this is the detritus food chain that is the detritus starts with the dead and decaying matter but there is a common understanding between the grazing food chain and detritus food chain because both are linked how will be both linked how means the grazing food chain are either plants and animals that will be dead for example in a grazing food chain the plant may be died the caterpillar may be dead or the lizard may be dead or the snake may be dead so anything may be dead either the plant or the animal so this dead and decaying matter constitutes the litter so this litter is then eaten by the earthworms so 
this is interconnected that is the grazing food chain and the detritus food chain is interconnected because the source is the same that it may be plants caterpillar or lizard or anything so this is the type of food chain the grazing food chain comes first and then the detritus food chain comes second so let's deal with food web so what is a food web so if you look at the food chain the food chain represents only one part of the food or energy through an ecosystem for example in the last food chain we saw that the plant is eaten by the rabbit the rabbit by the snake and the snake by the hawk when all these dies it is decomposed by the decomposer so this is a only one pathway of the food that is there is only one pathway over here but food web is not like that it is totally different from a food chain that is a various amount of food chain together put forms the food web so in a food web the same food is a part of more than one chain especially at the lower trophic level for example this same food that is the grass is food for grasshopper rabbit and then the mouse so the same food is part of more than one chain that is there is 1 2 3 three chains are here so this constitutes the food web over here so and then especially at the lower trophic level so the grass is at the lower trophic level that is the primary producer so this primary producer is the food for more than one food chain so this grass is eaten by grasshopper and then the grasshopper is eaten by the lizard and then the lizard by the hawk and then again this grass is consumed by the rabbit and then the rabbit is eaten by hawk and then again this grass is eaten by the mouse and the mouse is eaten by the snake and the snake by the hawk so this constitutes the food web so various amounts of food chain put together is called as the food web so under ecological pyramids there are three subheadings the pyramid of numbers the pyramid of biomass and the pyramid of energy so what is pyramid of numbers it is determined by the terms of individuals in a trophic level so before that what is an ecological pyramid ecological pyramid is the various trophic levels that are explained in a diagrammatic way so you can see diagrams all over here so the ecological pyramid is explained by the various trophic levels in a diagrammatic way so first thing is pyramid of numbers so what are pyramid of numbers so in pyramid of numbers the diagrammatic representation will be upright as well as inverted that is straight like this or the pyramid will be inverted so pyramid of numbers is both upright and inverted so upright constitute two systems that is the land pyramid and the aquatic pyramid so in the land pyramid you can see the base is grass that is always the base will be producers that is in terms of numbers that is grass will be to a huger extent that is it will cover the land to a huger extent so it comes to the bottom that is the producers will come to the bottom that is and the length of this will be determined the by the number of individuals that is grass is large so the length of the trophic level will be big and then the grass is eaten by the grasshopper and the mouse snake and then the hawk so this is the ecological pyramid in terms of numbers and in land and then in aquatic system it will be the plankton which will be eaten by the smaller fish and the smaller fish is consumed by the large fish and then the pelicans it is in terms of numbers that is the plankton will be more in number when compared to smaller fish and smaller fish will be more in number when compared to larger fish and then the pelican will be i'm i'm sorry and the larger fish will be more in number when comparing to the pelican so this is the ecological pyramid in terms of numbers when it is upright in land and aquatic system so when will it be inverted so the ecological pyramid may be from a single tree also so there is a tree over here there is only one tree over here on this one tree there will be many birds living and this birds will have parasites and that will multiply into hyperparasites 
so there will be more number of hyperparasites in the inverted system of ecological pyramid in terms of numbers but in this the more number will be grass the more number will be planktons but here the more number will be hyper parasites so there is only one tree at the base so this we are done with ecological pyramid in terms of numbers so the next thing is ecological pyramid in terms of biomass so in terms of biomass you measure the kilograms so kilograms is the weight so you measure all these in terms of kilograms for example in biomass will also be upright as well as inverted so numbers also will be upright as well as inverted biomass will also be upright as well as inverted so in upright you will have plants at the base that will be consumed by the deer and then the wolves and then the lion but the biomass over here is thousand that is plants will contain more number of biomass and then the deer will be hundred wolves will be ten and then when the lion is consuming all this it will have only one kg to be consumed so this is the ecological pyramid in terms of biomass so individuals are weighted in biomass so we weigh this so biomass is nothing but the weight so we weigh this individuals are weighted instead of being counted so in ecological pyramid of numbers we are counting all the individuals we are counting the grass we are counting the plankton we are counting the pelican and putting it into various trophic levels but we don't do like that for biomass because we are weighing weighing the individuals so when you weigh the individual you take the dry weight you don't take the weight with the moisture you take the dry weight of the individual for example when you are taking the weight of a deer you take the dry weight of the deer and then you should collect all the organisms in this trophic level for example if you are weighing this plant over here you should weigh all the plants in the trophic level and that weight should be the dry weight so you should collect all organism and weigh their dry weight so in the ecological pyramid of biomass it overcomes the size difference problem so in ecological pyramid of numbers you have size difference problem for example you you have the size of grass to vary you have the size of grasshopper to be varied mouse to be varied but in biomass you are taking the dry weight so you don't need to worry about the size because you are taking the weight you don't need to worry about the size because you are taking the weight so we are done with biomass that is upright so we are going to deal with biomass which is inverted and that will be aquatic so we've done with land over here in biomass and we are going to deal with aquatic system in biomass so same thing replicates for aquatic system also the aquatic system the producers will be at the bottom because the weight of the producer dry weight of the producer will be less and next comes the uh, after producers it will be consumed by the primary consumers which is the smaller fish and then the larger fish and then the top carnivore in the aquatic system so this is same as the land system in biomass and next the last topic to be dealt under ecological pyramid is energy so in energy you take the kilo calories so always energy is measured in terms of kilo calories in ecological pyramid under energy the same way how you measure biomass in terms of kg or weight same thing you have to do with energy in terms of kilo calorie you have to note a very important point over here because the ecological pyramid of numbers will be both upright as well as inverted ecological pyramid of biomass will be upright as well as inverted but ecological pyramid of energy will only be upright and not inverted so this point has to be noted down and then in ecological pyramid of energy we already saw how the energy flows from this level to this level so the same concept should be applied over here that is there will be a huge amount of grass consumed by the grasshopper that by the rat and the rat will be consumed by the hawk so the energy that is the heat will be reduced so the energy always decreases from the trophic levels so the grass will have the highest amount of energy and then that is the 1000 kilocalories for example and the grasshopper will have 100 kilocalories 
and the rats will have 10 and finally when the hawk consumes it will have only 1 kilocalorie so the energy is being reduced so there is an energy flow over here so in ecological pyramid this is the energy flow and then this ecological pyramid well explains the concept of biological magnification that is we are going to deal with biological magnification in our next topic so let's recall so ecological pyramid is constituted into three main headings that is the ecological pyramid of numbers biomass and then the energy in numbers you have upright as well as inverted land and aquatic and in biomass you have upright as well as inverted land and aquatic and only in energy you have only upright and not inverted and biological magnification will be dealt with. So in this topic we are going to deal with bioaccumulation and biomagnification. So before that I will explain about pollutants and trophic levels. So what are pollutants? So pollutants are the non-degraded ones that goes through various trophic levels. So what is non-degraded ones? So the non-degraded ones are the ones that cannot be metabolized by the living organism. For example, plastics cannot be metabolized by the living organism. So that enters the various trophic levels in our system. So what are pollutants? Pollutants are the non-degraded ones that goes through various trophic levels. And the non-degraded ones are the ones that cannot be metabolized by the living organism. Example, plastics. So, the pollutants should be in small concentration. That is, even a small concentration of pollutant in a trophic level will reach high dosage when it reaches the top trophic level. I will give a better example for that. Before that, let us see what is bioaccumulation and biomagnification. So what is bioaccumulation? Accumulation is nothing but something that is going and accumulating in a trophic level. So accumulation is how pollutants enter a food chain. So entering a food chain, for example, we already saw what is a food chain that starts with plant and then goes to rabbit and then the rabbit is eaten by the hawk. So this is a food chain. So this food chain it will start with the producer that is the green plant. So pollutants enter the first organism in the food chain. So the increase in the concentration of pollutant to the first organism in a food chain is bioaccumulation. That is in bioaccumulation there will be an increase of pollutants from the first organism in the food chain. That is the plant will get affected first and then it will reach the rabbit and then it will reach the hawk in biomagnification. But in bioaccumulation only the first organism should be taken into account. So bioaccumulation is nothing but the how, how the pollutants enter the food chain is basically termed as bioaccumulation. So then what is biomagnification? So biomagnification is nothing but there is water over here. First the pollutant will enter the water. For example from industrial waste, agricultural waste, domestic waste. From all these the pollutant will enter the water. And then that water will be used by the producers. And then from the producers to the zooplanktons. And then the zooplanktons to the small fish small fish to large fish and the large fish to hawk. So this is called as biomagnification. Something that is magnifying is called as biomagnification. So in biomagnification, the pollutant moves from one trophic level to another that is from water to producer, producer to zooplankton and then finally to the hawk. So this moves from one trophic level to another. So there are various conditions to be met by the pollutant. For example, I already said to you all what is non-degraded materials that is which cannot be metabolized by living organism. That is which cannot be degraded by the living organism or which cannot be consumed by the living organism. That is something toxic to the living organism is basically called as non-degraded materials or pollutants. So in that conditions, the pollutant should be long lived. For example, I said about plastic which cannot be metabolized or consumed or degraded by living organism. So that is long lived. For example, take plastics 
that are long lived and it should be mobile mobile means it should move from one trophic level to another trophic level easily it shouldn't stay in this trophic level alone and then it cannot be magnified so that it should move from one trophic level to another and then it should be soluble in fats so milk is a better example for fat and then this pollutant should be soluble in the fats and the last condition to be kept in mind is it should be biologically active that is it should live for a longer time and it should affect all the organism biologically active means it should affect all the organisms in the trophic level so these are all the conditions for the pollutants first thing should be long lived it should be mobile it should be soluble in fats and it should be biologically active for example the pollutant in the milk will be checked that is the pollutant in the milk will be checked because milk is a fat and in fat the pollutant will live long so in this way you can measure the amount of toxins that is the pollutants in the milk so this is called as biological accumulation that is something which enters the food chain and biological magnification that is something which moves from one trophic level to another and the conditions for the pollutant to be live long is all these so we are done with bio accumulation and bio magnification and the next topic is biotic interaction so what is biotic interaction that is the organisms are interlinked in our system so that interaction between the organism is biotic interaction so there are various kinds of biotic interaction for example mutualism commensalism competition predation parasitism amensalism neutralism so all these are the various interaction between organisms so there is a box over here plus means the organisms have benefited minus means the organism is harmed zero means the organism is neutral so let's see the example so in mutualism there are two kinds of organism that is plus and plus in mutualism both are mutual hence no organism will be harmed and both will be benefited for example the birds feed on the plants for nectar for example the bees will feed on the plants for nectar and the plants will be benefited in terms of seed dispersal and pollination and hence both the plants and the birds are benefited this is called as mutualism and this kind of biotic interaction is good because both the organisms are benefited and the next thing is commensalism so what is commensalism commensalism is nothing but one organism is benefited and the other organism is neutral that is it won't be harmed or neither benefited hence it will be neutral for example the beetle that is living on the cow dung so it takes the cow dung and it lives on top of the cow dung so the beetle will be benefited but the cow has no benefit in that or the cow dung has no benefit in that so it becomes neutral for the cow dung and the beetle will be benefited this relationship is called as common salism next thing is competition in a competition both will be negative because both are competing for the same thing for example there is a food and that food is being fought for so two organisms are fighting for the same food and hence there is a competition prevailing between both organism hence both own be benefited so this is called as competition the next thing is predation already you all know what is a predator something that feeds on another organism so in predation one organism will be benefited and the other organism will be harmed hence if there is a big fish the big fish eats the small fish so so the small fish will be died and the big fish will be benefited so it is plus that is it will be benefited and over here it is minus it will be harmed hence in predation one organism will be benefited and the other organism will be harmed next is parasitism you already know a very good example in parasitism because one organism will be benefited the other organism will be harmed just like predation because in parasitism for example there is tick living on your heads 
that tick is harmful for us but it takes it sucks in the blood from our head and lives on our warmth and shelter so this tick is getting benefited but our we humans are getting harmed so this relationship between two organism is called parasitism next thing is after parasitism amensalism so what is amensalism amensalism is nothing but if there is a huge tree over here and a small plant over here this tree gives shade for this plant but there is no sunlight penetration to this plant because the tree blocks all the sunlight so this plant is not getting benefited and this tree has no effect so this relationship between a small plant and a big tree where the small plant is getting affected because it is not getting sunlight it becomes harmed minus and then the big tree has no effect so the big tree is neutral so minus and zero is amensalism and the last topic to be dealt under biotic interaction is neutralism so what is neutralism so neutralism can be well explained with this example for example there is cactus in the desert and on that cactus you can see a tarantula tarantula is nothing but a hairy spider so there will be no relationship between cactus and tarantula because the cost and benefits get tallied so this relationship is called neutralism but various scientists says that there is no concept called as neutralism because in our ecosystem or in our biodiversity all the organisms either get benefited harm there is no concept called neutralism but for our better understanding we have a point called as neutralism and a better example is cactus and the spider which lives on the desert and both gets either benefited nor get harmed so they they stay in a place called as neutral so these are all the biotic interaction and let's recall it is mutualism commensalism competition predation parasitism amensalism and the last thing to be noted down is neutralism so now we are done with biotic interaction and the next topic is bio geo chemical cycle so what is bio geo chemical cycle so before going into bio geo chemical cycle so you already know what is energy and nutrients so always there is a loss of heat when the energy is transferred from one trophic level to another and then the nutrients the nutrients is always recycled for example if the nutrients are taken from the soil and the plant dies some days this nutrients go back to the soil so this is the cycle recycling of process over here so in bio geo chemical cycle the energy and nutrients play a very very important role so all the living organisms are made up of carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen phosphorus and various other components these are the elements and components we are made up of so all these play a very important role in this cycle and then these are always in circulation so what is circulation so the non living thing and the living thing that is these elements and components moves from non living to living thing and then back to the non living thing that is you've seen already the nutrients are taken from the soil which is a non living thing and then it is taken by the plants which are the living things so the nutrient go back to the non living thing that is the soil when the plant dies so there is a circulation over here this circulation is called as bio geo chemical cycle so what is bio let's break the word into part by part so bio as we already know are living components so bio is living and geo is atmosphere atmosphere so that there is a bio geo chemical all these are chemicals so there is a bio geo chemical cycle happening around the earth and then to know the cycle properly let's see this example so for example there are producers over here so there are producers over here which are eaten by the consumers 
and then the producers and consumers die someday which are then decomposed by the decomposer so then this nutrient that is the producer and consumer gets added to the soil and then this soil is then mixed with the water and then the minerals which is again consumed by the producers so this cycle is the nutrient cycle we already saw what is bio geochemical cycle and this cycle is happening here and that is called as a nutrient cycle and then nutrient cycles are of various types so what are those so in, the, in these nutrient cycles the important nutrient cycle is carbon and nitrogen cycle so this carbon and nitrogen cycle gets added in the soil nutrients and then used by the producers so there are various kinds of nutrient cycle in that the very important nutrient cycle is carbon and nitrogen cycle so there are types of nutrient cycles so what are these types of nutrient cycles for example there are perfect and imperfect nutrient cycle which means the replacement time is taken into account for example uh, the plants are getting utilized and then it goes back into the soil so there is a recycling time which is fast or either slow so depending on that the nutrient cycle is divided into perfect and imperfect perfect is nothing but it is very soon added to the atmosphere or hydrosphere that is it is utilized and very soon given for recycling but in imperfect it is not given very soon the cycle is very slow so that is the difference between perfect and imperfect nutrient cycle and then for example all the gaseous cycle carbon nitrogen and all comes under the perfect cycle so gases are very much cycled and then given back to the atmosphere or hydrosphere so that comes under perfect what is imperfect nutrient cycle is all the sedimentary cycle comes under imperfect because in those sediments it gets stuck under the earth's crust and it's very hard to come out as soon as possible hence the cycle will be very slow for example in the earth's crust the sediments get stuck that's why it is called as imperfect and under imperfect the sedimentary cycle plays a very important role so let's recall the bio geochemical in bio geochemical cycle the energy and nutrients play a very very important role and these nutrients are being recycled from non living to living and then again to non living so this cycle that is living to atmosphere is called as bio geo and all these chemicals carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen phosphorus plays a very important role hence it is called as bio geo chemical cycle and this is the nutrient cycle diagram that is a producers consumers all are being eaten and then it dies and decomposes again add back to the soil that is from living to non living again to living this is called as nutrient cycle and then the very two important nutrient cycles are carbon and nitrogen and this keeps adding new soil nutrients and then there are types of nutrient cycle perfect and imperfect so under perfect all the gaseous cycle plays a very important role and imperfect cycle sedimentary cycle plays a very important role under the gaseous atmosphere and hydrogen comes and under the sedimentary cycle the earth crust plays an important role so let's move to the gaseous and sedimentary cycle so we are dealing with nutrient cycle so the first subheading under nutrient cycle is gaseous cycle so under gaseous cycle you have water carbon and nitrogen cycle already we saw that the carbon and nitrogen cycle are very important cycles so let's deal with the water cycle so water cycle is otherwise called as hydrological cycle and you all will be very well confined to the hydrological cycle because it is very easy and the hydrological cycle starts with the sun so the basic concept or energy over here is sun so the energy is derived from the sun so the water is stored in various reservoirs like atmosphere rivers lakes and then soil so in all these components the water is stored and this water enters from one layer 
to another i mean from atmosphere to river river to lake or lake to atmosphere through this hydrological cycle which is in terms of evaporation and then transpiration that is the water vapor from the leaves is taken back into the atmosphere by the process called as transpiration and then condensation and then ground water flow by all these process the water is moved from one level to another level so this is called as the hydrological cycle and then cycling of all other nutrient is dependent on water because water is the basic solvent or medium in which all other nutrients are getting mixed up so if the water is cycled only all these nutrients will also be cycled so cycling of all other nutrient is dependent on water and then water act as a solvent medium for the uptake of nutrients to organism as i already said you all the water is a solvent medium which holds all the nutrients inside hence this nutrients can be consumed by the organism with the help of water so water acts as a medium so this cycle is called as water cycle which the basic energy is derived from the sun and then it moves to various level of the atmosphere or rivers lakes or soil through all these processes called as evaporation transpiration ground water flow and then condensation condensation is from the clouds to the land so from all these processes you are very well thorough with hydrological cycle let's move into the carbon cycle so with a carbon cycle carbon is minor when compared to oxygen and nitrogen already you all know the composition of atmosphere in that carbon is very less means it is very minor in quantity and then when compared to oxygen and nitrogen it is very very less that is it constitute around 0.003 percentage and then carbon dioxide is very very important because it produces carbohydrates through photosynthesis so the plants right it takes in carbon dioxide and releases carbohydrates through the process called as photosynthesis so let us understand this carbon process or carbon cycle through a better example with diagrams so in this you can find the producers in this level and then you can find the animal over here so this animal respirates so it breathes in and breathes out so while breathing out it gives back carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and while when it is releasing the waste materials those waste materials are biodegraded that is these are decomposed and then that releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and then when these dead plants are decomposed that is when they are biodegraded that also releases carbon dioxide so this carbon dioxide is taken by these plants to the process called as photosynthesis so in this cycle you can see that carbon dioxide is very well replaced back to the atmosphere so this is called as carbon cycle and then in carbon cycle there are two types first one is the short term cycle and the second one is the long term cycle so what do you think a short term cycle is so we saw here right this diagrammatic representation where this animals plants are decomposed and then the carbon dioxide is taken back to the atmosphere this is called as short term cycle that is the carbon is utilized and then given to the atmosphere at a sooner rate so what is long term cycle long term cycle for example this carbon dioxide will be stored under the aquatic system or the land system for a very long time and then when erosion takes place or weathering takes place it is revealed back to the atmosphere so this is long term cycle for example in aquatic system when the carbon dioxide or carbon components are stored inside the aquatic system and through erosion it comes out as carbon dioxide or carbonates or bicarbonates and when they are deposited in the earth's crust millions and millions of years these are called as fossil fuels for example coal they are deposited under the earth for a very long period of time so this is called as fossil fuels when you burn the fossil fuels it gives carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere this is called as 
long term cycle and this process is called as short term cycle so let's recall carbon cycle carbon is very minor in the atmosphere when you compare it with oxygen or nitrogen and then carbon dioxide is very very important because it produces carbohydrates and then through the process called as photosynthesis so this process is called as short term cycle and this process where it gets deposited under the earth's crust or the water is called as long term cycle so under the gaseous cycle next comes the nitrogen cycle so we've dealt with water that is the hydrological cycle and the carbon cycle now we move into the nitrogen cycle so what is a nitrogen cycle so nitrogen cycle is essential constituent of protein that is nitrogen constitute a lot of protein what are proteins are proteins are the building blocks for us for any living organism you need to consume protein in order to take in the building blocks so these are the building blocks for the living organism so nitrogen cycle is very very important so of all the proteins there are various amount of proteins so of all the proteins nitrogen is 16 percentage so if you take 100 percentage proteins nitrogen will be 16 percentage in the atmosphere so more amount of nitrogen in atmosphere so if you take atmosphere there are more amount of nitrogen as we already saw carbon is very less that is in minor quantity but oxygen and nitrogen will be more so more amount of nitrogen in atmosphere but what is happening is but this is in elemental form so this elemental form cannot be used by us so that elemental form cannot be used by us or green plants or anything so it cannot be used by living organism so the concept is there are more amount of nitrogen present in atmosphere but it is in the elemental form that elemental form cannot be used by living organism so it has to be converted so that converting process so nitrogen should be fixed fixed means converting from nitrogen to ammonia or nitrates or nitrites so this is not the elemental form of nitrogen so nitrogen is in elemental form that elemental form cannot be used by living organism hence it should be converted into ammonia nitrites or nitrates that can be further used by the plants plants cannot consume nitrogen which is in elemental form in the atmosphere hence it should be converted to ammonia nitrites or nitrates for the plants to be used hence this nitrogen fixing is done in three ways that is nitrogen can be converted into ammonia nitrites or nitrates in three ways what are those three ways first thing is the by the microorganism microorganism can convert the elemental to these forms and then by man using industrial process so man can convert this nitrogen into ammonia nitrites or nitrates by the industrial process and third from a little amount of thunder or lightning from elemental form it can be converted into ammonia nitrates or nitrites so these are the three processes involving conversion of elemental form to these three kinds so this is the nitrogen cycle so let's deal with the nitrogen cycle in a diagrammatic representation so under the nitrogen cycle the nitrogen that is the elemental form of nitrogen cannot be used by plants so it has to be converted into ammonia nitrates or nitrites to be used by the plants so if there is a plant over here it cannot take the elemental form of nitrogen and hence this elemental form or the atmospheric form of nitrogen should be converted into ammonium ions so by whom it will be converted is by the bacteria here the bacteria plays a very important role so there are three types of bacteria in the soil that converts the elemental form of nitrogen into ammonium ions the first one is the free living nitrifying bacteria in the soil for example astrobacter this converts the nitrogen that is the atmospheric nitrogen to ammonium ions and the second thing is the symbiotic nitrifying bacteria that lives in the leguminous plants 
and hence the example for this kind of symbiotic nitrifying bacteria is rhizobium you would have already learned about rhizobium in your lower classes and then the third kind of bacteria is blue green algae that lives on the soil which converts the nitrogen into ammonium ions example for that is anabena so we are done with the first part of the nitrogen cycle and then some nitrogen that is some atmospheric nitrogen can be directly taken by the plants by this process so what is this process so some plants directly takes and then converts into nitrates and nitrites and then these ammonium ions are used by these plants by some bacteria called as nitrosomonas so this ammonium ions for example the nitrates and nitrites should be converted so for example the nitrates and nitrites should be converted by these bacteria to be used further by these plants for example the bacteria nitrosomonas converts the ammonia to nitrite so the ammonia should be converted into nitrite and then the next bacteria called as nitrobacter converts this nitrite to nitrate and hence finally this nitrate is used by this plants through amino acids this amino acids are the building blocks for this plants so this these are called as the proteins for the plants so this plant reaches the higher trophic level i mean this plant is eaten by the herbivore and then the carnivore top carnivore and then when that organism dies the nitrogen is taken back to the soil so let's come again so some plants directly take this ammonium ions and convert them using these bacteria convert into what convert into nitrates and nitrites so this conversion is taken up by the bacteria called as nitrosomonas so the bacteria plays a very important role the nitrosomonas converts the ammonia to nitrite and this nitrite is converted to nitrate by the nitrobacter and when this nitrate is consumed by the plants it is taken as amino acids which are the building blocks that is the proteins for the plants and when this plant reaches the higher trophic level and when and when that animal dies it the nitrogen goes back to the soil so this process is also a type of nitrogen cycle so some nitrogen is very much soluble in water for example this nitrates or nitrites are very much soluble in water and they go along with the water into oceans or rivers or lakes so that nitrogen is very much soluble so these form of nitrogen are nitrates nitrites and ammonia so these are very much soluble in water and hence the denitrifying bacteria over here plays a very important role because the nitrogen should be taken back to the atmosphere through this cycle and hence the denitrifying bacteria called as the pseudomonas which converts this form of nitrogen to the elemental form of nitrogen so it completes the cycle from here to here and the last thing to be noted down under nitrogen cycle is how a thunder forms a major part of the nitrogen cycle so when there is a thunder the elemental form of nitrogen is converted into ammonia nitrates or nitrites and hence this from the atmosphere comes back to the earth that is to the soil through the process of precipitation and hence this nitrates is taken back by the plants through this process again so there is a cycle on this whole process and hence from atmosphere to soil and from soil to atmosphere there is a nitrogen cycle so here we are done with nitrogen cycle so we are done with the gaseous cycle let's move to the sedimentary cycle so under the sedimentary cycle we are going to deal with phosphorus cycle and sulfur cycle because these two cycles are very important so let's deal with phosphor cycle first so this cycle does not take place through atmosphere so in gaseous cycle only takes place through atmosphere the sedimentary cycle own takes place through atmosphere and hence it takes place through erosion sedimentation 
volcanic activity etc so the main point to be noted down under sedimentary cycle is this cycle won't take place in atmosphere it will take place under the process called as erosion sedimentation and volcanic activity and under phosphorus cycle you will note that phosphorus is present in phosphate rocks and enters the cycle through as we already said erosion and mining activity so this phosphorus will be present in phosphate rocks because these are sediments so hence it will be present in phosphate rocks the rocks are formed through sedimentary process so hence it is located in the phosphorus rocks and it enters the cycle through erosion and mining activity when it is done it comes out the next point is the main cause for excessive growth in rooted plants and microscopic plants in lakes for example this phosphorus in the aquatic system will help the growth of plants but when it is in excess quantity it will help the growth of rooted plants and microscopic plants like phytoplankton in the lakes so this phosphorus cycle will cause an excessive growth in the lake so the main storage of phosphorus is in earth's crust that is in the land in the aquatic it will be found in phosphate rocks but in land it will be found in the earth's crust and then in land it will be in terms of phosphates and not phosphorus so it will be in terms of phosphates when these phosphates are subjected to weathering this will enter into the ocean system through rivers or lakes and hence in these ocean system they will be deposited in the continental shelf means in this area so they will be deposited in this area that is called as the continental shelf and then these phosphates through weathering action enters the cycle and then hence again the cycle begins from the first so let's move into the phosphorus cycle so the phosphorus is present in water as well as land so in water it will be present in phosphate rocks so in water it will be present in phosphate rocks and enters the cycle through erosion and mining activity so when there is an erosion inside the aquatic system and when there is mining action done so through these two processes the phosphate rocks will undergo the cycle and the next point to be noted down is the main cause for excessive growth of rooted plants and microscopic organisms like phytoplankton in lakes is because of phosphorus so when there is an excessive amount of phosphorus in the water system it will give growth to the excessive rooted plants and microscopic plants in the lakes and then the main storage of phosphorus is in the earth's crust i mean in the land the phosphorus will be in a huge quantity in the earth's crust and then the phosphorus will be in terms of phosphates and not phosphorus so in land the phosphorus will be in terms of phosphates and in water it will be in terms of phosphate rocks so when these phosphates undergo weathering on the earth's crust and it will enter the oceans through rivers or streams or rainfall or runoff so through these oceans it will reach the continental shelf so the continental shelf is here and then it will reach this continental shelf and then what will happen is the deposits in this continental shelf will be insoluble deposit that means it won't be soluble in water it will be insoluble hence the name as sedimentary cycle so over here the phosphates are deposited as insoluble deposit and hence what will happen is these insoluble deposits when they are exposed to the land i mean when this plates under the crust when it comes top they are exposed to the land and again the same process such as the weathering will happen and then the cycle will begin again on the land so there is a cycle in the water which comes back to the land and then the same process of weathering and ero erosion will occur and the cycle begins again so this is the phosphorus cycle we are done with phosphorus cycle so let's move into the sulfur cycle so what is a sulfur cycle so sulfur reservoir as we saw everything is stored so something that is being stored is called as a reservoir 
So sulfur reservoir is in soil. That is sulfur is present in soil and sediments. That is they are locked. They are locked in organic as well as inorganic form. So they are locked in organic like coal and oil are examples of organic sulfur. And inorganic substances like sulfur rocks which are present on the land. So these are the two forms of sulfur. One is the organic and next one is the inorganic. So in the form of sulfates, sulfides and organic sulfur. So sulfur is in the form of sulfates, sulfides and organic sulfur in the soil and sediments. So next thing is this sulfates, sulfides and organic sulfur should be released. So it is released by the process called as weathering. So weathering is nothing but when the wind is blowing in one direction, this part of the rock gets eroded and it becomes flat like this. So this is the process called as weathering. So this sulfur is released by the process of weathering of rocks and erosional runoff. That is the water runoff and decomposition of this organic matter. We saw the organic sulfur, right? It is present in coal and oil. So it is released by the process of weathering. And then this sulfur cycle what we are seeing now is mostly sedimentary. We are seeing sedimentary only. It will be mostly in the form of sedimentary except two of its components. So sulfur cycle is mostly sedimentary except two of its compounds such as the hydrogen sulfide H2S and sulfur dioxide SO2. So these two forms are in the gaseous form. All other forms like sulfates, sulfides and organic sulfur are sedimentary form. But except hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide are in the gaseous form. So this sulfur enters into the atmosphere. So it has to go through a cycle, right? So it enters into the atmosphere from volcanic eruption. So when there is a volcano, so... It, the sulfur will be present in the rocks. So when there is an eruption, this sulfur comes out. So sulfur enters the atmosphere from volcanic eruption, combustion of fossil fuel. For example, when you burn coal, it is combustion. So when you burn coal, the sulfur is released from those organic matter. So sulfur enters the atmosphere through volcanic eruption, combustion of fossil fuel. So we were seeing about the gaseous form of sulfur, right? So in that, the atmospheric hydrogen sulfide is converted into sulfur dioxide through oxidization. And then the same atmospheric hydrogen sulfide is converted into weak sulfuric acid when it get mixed up with the rain. So when there is precipitation, that sulfur, that is the atmospheric hydrogen sulfide which is present on the atmosphere, get mixed up with the rain water and reaches the earth surface. So that will be a form of weak sulfur dioxide, SO2. So this is the sulfur cycle. So when you take it in a diagrammatic representation, these plants also take in sulfur through the form of sulfates. Already we saw sulfur is in the form of sulfates, sulfides and organic sulfur in the soil. So this plant take up the sulfates and then that sulfate is entered into the food chain. When a herbivore is consuming this plant, it enters the food chain and then that herbivore excretes. So through the process of excretion, it enters the soil. So there is a cycle over here and this cycle is called as sulfur cycle. So we've dealt with the nutrient cycle that is the gaseous cycle and the sedimentary cycle is done with it. So the last topic under this chapter is succession. So what is a succession? So succession is a universal process of directional change in vegetation on a time scale. For example, you were a baby when you were born and then you started growing. So there is a directional change from year 1, year 2 to year 20. Same way there is succession in the plant system also that is in our ecological system also. So succession is nothing but it is a universal process that is it grows everything that has life grows. So that growth is called as a universal process. 
so succession is a universal process of directional change so you are changing so that is directional so of directional change in vegetation i meant in the plant kingdom so it is the vegetation on a time scale so there is a time scale for that growth so these are the key points to be noted down under the succession or the definition for succession so it is a universal process of directional change in vegetation on a time scale so these are the key points to be noted down so for example there is a plant over here it grows to be a shrub and then those shrub turn into softwood trees and finally it turns into the hardwood trees so this is the process of succession which is a direction it moves in this direction and it is a vegetative process and finally it moves on a time scale that is from the plant to this hardwood tree it takes time for the growth so this is called as succession and then this succession occurs when a series of community replaces one another due to large scale destruction for example when this is destroyed only this comes so a community is replaced by another community so succession occur when a series of communities replace one another they are getting replaced by another community and this community from here jumps into a another place so this is replaced another due to large scale destruction so definitely for succession to occur you need a large scale destruction and that large scale destruction may be man made or natural so these are the two kinds of succession and that large scale destruction should be man made or either natural and this process continues until a mature community develops for example from this plant to this mature community called the hardwood trees which is a stable community it stays for a longer period of time it will continue this succession will continue until when it reaches the stable community so this process continues until a mature community develops and then succession is a progressive change you can see from plant to shrub softwood to hardwood so this is progression it is growing so succession is always progressive so succession is a progressive change so it is a stable climax community already we saw this community is called a stable climax community which is stable because it is the climax community and then the first plant to occur in succession is called as pioneer so if there is a land over here and there were no growth of plants and when this plant is occurring for the first time this plant is called as pioneer community so the first plant to occur on that area is called as pioneer and the so the final plant to occur on that area is called as climax community as we already saw it is a stable climax community so the first plant to occur is called as piney and the final to occur is called as climax community and there is a intermediate stage in between so that intermediate stage is called as successional stages or series so this is the pioneer this is the climax and these two intermediate stages are called as the successional stages or series so this is up with the succession so let's see the type of succession so we already saw what is a succession so let us see what are the characteristics of the succession so succession has high productivity and then the area under succession will have high diversity of organism that is there will be a huge diversity variation between the organism and then there will be a gradual increase in the food web because the diversity of the organism keeps increasing so these are the characteristic of the succession that is the productivity of the land will keep increasing and then the diversity of the organism will increase because the productivity is increasing and then lastly there will be a gradual increase in food web that is there will be a lot of organisms prevailing in that area so these are the characteristic of the succession 
So now let's move into the types of succession and this is the last topic under chapter 2. So what are the types of succession? So there are four types of succession. Primary, secondary, autogenic and allogenic succession and then autotrophic and heterotrophic succession. So these are the four types of succession. So let us move into the primary succession. So what is a primary succession? So in a primary succession, there will be a new site. So in that site, nothing will be occupying previously. So this will be a plain site where you cannot find any organism. So this plain site will be occupied by the pioneer community. I already said you all, the first community to appear in that land is called as pioneer community. So, what are these pioneer community? These pioneer community for examples are microbes, lichens, mosses, the basic plants that grow in that area. And then these pioneer community alter the habitat of this new site because these pioneer community alters the habitat is generally the living place. So, it will alter the living place that means the habitat of that place. And this give rise to a new condition. So there were new site earlier. This new site was occupied by the pioneer community and that changed the habitat of that place and that habitat gives rise to new condition in that place. So this new condition gives way for additional organism in that place. So there were new site and then pioneer community altered the habitat, new condition and then additional organisms started adding up to this community. Next what happened was, then lately this pioneer community got died, that is they died and it added nutrients to the soil. Those pioneer communities died and added nutrients to the soil and that nutrients were added to each layer or substratum of the land. So these are the substratum. Initially it was a new site when the pioneer community died here another layer of substratum was formed in a different period and over here the pioneer community was there and it kept on adding. So the layer kept on adding and the nutrient level kept on increasing and then there was seed dispersal and there was growth. So growth of plants started happening. So in the later period this pioneer community got disappeared and then it was replaced by the preceding community. Later plants and then the producers, consumers and then the top carnivores and omnivores all started coming in this new site. So this is the primary succession and lately in this primary succession, you can see diverse, diversity. Already we saw about diversity. It was diverse and the competition kept increasing because one species kept coming after the another and hence the competition between these two started increasing and a niche also started developing. In the earlier chapter, we dealt with niche. Niche is the unique functional role or a place in which an organism holds in the ecosystem. So this niche also kept developing. So let's recall the primary succession. Earlier in primary succession, there were a new site and this new site was occupied by the pioneer community and this pioneer community for example are mosses, lichens and this altered the habitat of that place and new species started coming in because of the new conditions and then it started adding organism day by day. And then this pioneer community got disappeared someday and was replaced by the preceding community, I mean the later community. And then what happened was when these started dying, it started adding nutrients to the soil. And finally, the characteristic again for the pioneer community is it was diverse because new organisms started coming to that site. And then the competition kept increasing and then the niche also developed in that place. So let's deal with secondary succession. So under types of succession, the primary succession is done. So let's deal with the secondary succession. So what is a secondary succession? In a secondary succession, the climax community will be disturbed. I mean, we already saw what is a succession. It starts with the pioneer community 
and we have the intermediate stages called the cirrus and then the last mature community called as the climax community or the stable community. So this climax community will be disturbed and there will be a complete or partial destruction of the existing community in this climax community. And later what will happen is this mature or intermediate community. So this intermediate community or this mature community may be disturbed by flood or fire. So this mature community or intermediate community will be disturbed by fire or flood or drought or any natural or man-made causes. Hence this community is disturbed or it is destructed and here comes the role of the secondary succession. Actually what happens is the this abandoned land that is after the flood or fire there will be an abandoned land over here. This abandoned land will be occupied by hard grasses which can sustain or survive in the sun baked soil that is it will be hard. There will be patches in this ground and over the grasses will appear and those grasses will be accompanied later by the trees and later mice, rabbits and insects occupy this place and later this place will turn into a forest system. So this is how the secondary succession comes into place. And finally we have to learn the difference between primary and secondary succession. So what is a primary succession? So something that starts on a new site is called as primary succession. So in a bare soil the primary succession will happen and then the secondary succession will happen in a well developed soil because already we saw the secondary succession happens in the climax community or the intermediate stages over here. So in these two stages. And later this primary succession will take years, millions of years to form. So it will be slow. Meanwhile, the secondary succession will be faster. So it will grow at a faster rate. So these are the two differences between the primary and secondary succession. So let's recall in a secondary succession, the climax community will be disturbed. So there will be complete or partial destruction and that will be by means of flood or fire and later that land will become abandoned. This abandoned land that is abandoned is there will be nothing in that land. That land will be occupied by hard grasses and later by trees and later by all these living organisms and later this abandoned land will be converted into forest. So let us see the distinction between primary and secondary succession. So this will be formed on the bare soil, this will be formed on a well developed soil, this will be slow and this will grow at a faster rate. So we are done with primary and secondary succession. So now let's move to autogenic and allogenic substances. So this is also very very easy. So in an autogenic succession, auto means by itself. So in an autogenic succession, Succession is brought about by living inhabitants of that community itself. For example, if there is a community prevailing in this place, a succession will be brought about by this community itself. So this is called as autogenic succession. Then what is allogenic succession? Allogenic succession is nothing but succession brought about by the outer forces. For example, if there is a land over here and some other community from outside land is coming and occupying here and bringing about a succession is called as allogenic succession. So auto means living inhabitants of that community itself, allogenic means from the outer forces. So we are done with autogenic and allogenic succession and the last succession to be dealt with is autotrophic and heterotrophic succession. So what is autotrophic? Autotrophic as you already know are formed by the green plants that is greater in quantity. If green plants are greater than the heterotrophs that is green plants after this green plants forms the primary consumers. So after the primary consumers comes the secondary consumers and then the tertiary consumers and finally the top carnivores. So all these are called as the heterotrophs. So if this green plants are large in quantity it is called as autotrophic succession and when these heterotrophs 
heterotrophs are large in quantity it is called as heterotrophic succession so heterotrophic succession the heterotrophs are greater in quantity so this is the difference between the autotrophic and heterotrophic succession so where will a succession take place at a huger quantity or at a faster rate it will be in the middle of the continent so if there is a continent over here this place promotes faster growth of the succession because it is at the middle and there will be a climax community already occupying at that place hence succession will take place at a sooner rate so we've dealt with all these chapters in chapter 2 so chapter 2 functions of an ecosystem is done and dusted so in our next topic let's move to the chapter 3 terrestrial ecosystem thanks for watching